There is another world, a place of wonder, fantastic creatures and places, people and their stories. It is glimpsed only in childhood fantasy, or in dreams you can't quite remember. This is one of those dreams. This is a story from the Veil world. Galo shielded his eyes against the sun. There was a plume of dust in the distance, but there was always dust. The river was nearly dry. That's why they were coming, of course. For the first time in centuries, the Hornberg would be assailable by land. He turned back to his trees. The buzzing sound soothed him. His mesh veil and helmet kept the wasps from stinging him where it truly hurt, and thick clothes protected him elsewhere. Besides, these were his wasps. They knew him, and he knew them, and they had protected each other more than once. He hadn't known Acri would turn to violence, but the wasps had stopped him long before he reached Gallo's house. There was something comical about that, for a man's best friends to be swarms of predatory insects. But when you are the only cultivator of wasp silk in a thousand miles, you take what you can get. This tree was somewhat unusual. A deer had perished underneath it, and the wasps had somehow gotten mixed up in its entrails. There were flecks of red and bits of gore clouding the silk that otherwise draped down from the trees. If he couldn't remove it before those troops arrived, the silk would be ruined. If it doesn't just get burned, Gallo thought to himself. As he worked, he whistled the wasp's song. His wife was always telling him to lay off of it, but his children liked it nearly as well as the wasps. The whole hive was swarming about him now, not stinging, just buzzing. He waved to them and waved them off, and set about dragging the deer out from underneath the silk. It was impossible, of course, to avoid getting tangled in the silk himself. Where the deer, a doe, Lay was almost entirely shrouded in the wasp strands, and there the wasps were thickest. Hundreds of wasps were continually scurrying up and down the strands from the carcass of the hive, so that the fibers were dyed scarlet by their activity. The draping silk almost completely obscured the outside, so that he was pushing aside curtains of sticky gossamer, with them closing behind him. He found the doe's legs and pulled at her until the wasp strands began pulling and snapping with soft pops. The wasps were thicker around him now, and they seemed to object to his removing their easy meal. Ladies, this will ruin your silk. I'm afraid you'll have to be satisfied with the mealworms I give you. This flesh is not for you. There was an angry buzzing in response but they hadn't started to try and sting him yet. No, it wasn't angry, insistent, determined, wanting to be heard. Ladies, I hear you. I will give you more to eat when this is all over, an extra portion. But I can't have you muck about like this. The buzzing grew louder, with a few wasps trying to sting, and even the wasp's strands seemed to oppose him, as if they were holding him under the tree. Gallo felt his own frustration rising, and he checked himself. The wasps didn't like when he got angry, and he couldn't blame them. But why today, of all days, had they ceased to cooperate with him? It was nearly twenty minutes before he emerged from the tree silk, streaked with red, and nearly coated with wasps. What have we here? a deep voice asked. Gallo dropped the deer and tried to clear his vision, and found to his horror a rider atop a tall horse, peering at him. Behind the rider were columns of men on horseback, passing through the muffled silence of his mulberry forest. The rider's insignia were from Daul, and Gallo wore the clothes of a hornsman. Gallo wasn't given time to speak. The man's sword arm rose and fell twice, and Gallo staggered, helmetless and bleeding from the neck and shoulders, back into the tree. His vision was narrowing quickly, and the buzzing, was that the wasps or his head, was getting louder every moment. 
The wasps were all about him. He could feel them crawling into his mouth and down his clothing, stinging everywhere they went, and he couldn't reach up to brush them away. It was some time later that he became aware the buzzing had coalesced into something coherent. Scialo, what are you waiting for? My wife and children. I'm waiting for the troops to pass so I can go... They are not here, but you are he already. Gallo felt faint, confused, weak, as if he were tumbling downward through the air. Where? Perhaps we can help one another. Your wife and children, yes? They are seeking you. They need you. You protect them as you protect us. Gallo could not reply, but his affirmative thought seemed sufficient. We will serve them for you, protect them and provide for them, as you could have. Will they do the same? Gallo's thoughts felt like falling forward, but his son and wife and all of his daughters knew their father's work. Who else could he have taught it to? Then we ask only one thing. You denied us flesh earlier when we tried to warn you. May we have yours now? Gallo laughed again. Wasps are friends, indeed. But why not? His fall finished, and he knew no more. The hornsmen pursued their quarry on foot, primarily, there were no horses, or strays, or stock left on either side after the siege. But there was anger and victory. When the river flooded, the hornsmen had poured out of the castle like the water that was roaring through the riverbed in the opposite direction. Only a few Dowlins had made it out of the river, and none of them were horseback. When they came to the northern fields, to a man they were arrested by the sounds of screaming heard over a cacophonous buzz. The silk trees north of the city, that crazy foreigner, what was his name? Were all crimson red, and the wasps had swollen to the size of a man's fist. Halt! came the order, but there was no need. No hornsman stepped into the trees, and no dowlin stepped back out of them. There is, in the capital, a brocade of stunning red silk, sold every year in autumn. The color, which ranges by bolt from iridescent scarlet to burnt maroon, seems to sharpen all of the hues around it. Every royal robe is made of this brocade, and this brocade alone, and it is the envy and desire of every courtier for a hundred miles. It is still harvested by one family, the de descendants of one gallo, now called the Autumn People. But their mulberry forest has spread some thirty miles north and west, so that it commands the entire junction between the River E and the River Y north of Gelden. The Autumn People would have you believe they speak with their silk-spinning creatures, though that's surely just superstition. Still, none can deny that their silk is without peer. Mm -hmm.